kindly silence all mobile devices as the program is about to begin. Here in New York City, the black maternal mortality rate is up to 12 times that of white women. 12 times. The statistics are staggering. The disparity in care is costing black women their lives. Centuries of poverty and marginalization among indigenous people. When I saw how so many indigenous youths like me get left behind, I was like, this is not fair. For me, the answer was robots. There are 18.4 million children not getting ASIC vaccinations because of the challenges of the last mile transportation. I was shocked and then I thought, there must be a way to solve it. racism and bias from maternity and infant care. I want to give students robots who wouldn't have them otherwise. It's a lot. The goal is to create a reliable cooling device to deliver these life-saving vaccines to the people who need them. Even though I know this is the right thing to do, it's just bloody difficult. <laughs> Please welcome Hala Hanna, Executive Director of Solve. Welcome back. <laughs> welcome back, everybody. How was the day? It's so nice to have you back here. Welcome to our closing plenary. Uh, by the way, this was the trailer of our first docuseries, which was made possible with the generous support of our longtime champion, HP. And um, it, I think it rings true particularly because today has been all about supporting exceptional, diverse innovators like uh, Kitty, uh, Kimberly, and Danielle. The episodes follow each of their uh, journey to scale, and we'll be talking about scale also this afternoon. Uh, but if you haven't seen the movies, you can now see all three of them at the link. Uh, you just have to make sure you have tissue. It's, it's really <laughs> attaching. <laughs> Before we jump into our first panel, I am really excited to introduce you to the newest community member, Cure, which, with whom we are designing and launching a custom challenge. And for some context, custom challenges enable our clients to design and launch their own innovation challenges using our expertise, running 70 challenges, our methodology, our uh, award-winning platform, and our reach to accomplish their organization's impact goals. Um, so, without further ado, to tell us more about a very timely challenge, please let welcome Seema Kumar, CEO of Cure, to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Hala, and good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, so wonderful to see this entire community here of solvers and people who love innovation challenges. I'm Seema Kumar, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm the CEO of Cure. So what is Cure, you might say? Cure is a 300,000 square feet innovation campus located right here in the heart of New York City. And we have wet labs, dry labs, it's a research facility and also a business facility. And our goal really is to bring together leaders, bring together solvers, people who actually want to work on the world's toughest healthcare challenges, people across disciplines, across sectors, across geographies, because we believe that at the intersection of disciplines, sectors, and geographies is where innovation happens. And so that's why we have launched the Cure Exchange. And uh, first of all, our mission is to do one thing and one thing only, and that's very simple, and it's contained in our logo. It's to cure, period. And that's why there's a period after our logo. And we actually have joined forces with MIT Solve, so I'm really, really pleased uh, that we have collaborated to design and launch the first ever Cure Exchange, remember, Exchange uh, Innovation Challenge 
uh, it's focused on health AI for good. So the challenge is now open for applications. We're looking for innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, young scientists, um, you know, computational biologists, anybody who has a great idea to bring to bear artificial intelligence, AI, to solve some of the toughest challenges in healthcare. healthcare. So we want them to do it responsibly and equitably. So we'd like to predict diseases before they actually happen, uh, cure diseases, improve health outcomes, and ultimately uh, live in a world free of disease and cures for us all. So uh, we're going to award multiple teams funding and resources. Uh, it's a prize pool of up to a million dollars. And this includes one year residency at Cure. So we're located on 345 Park Avenue South, and it's a beautiful building. So just being there as part of the ecosystem and learning from the mentorship that's available all around will help us. And we have our executive advisory board that uh, is got world-renowned people in this area to help advise along with our ecosystem. And one of them, Dr. Rick Bright, is uh, sitting here in the audience. And thank you for being here, Rick. So really what we want to do is to ask you all to join us. Uh, come be part of the cure and come join our ecosystem. And I can't wait to see the application. So thank you all very much. And if you know somebody who has a great idea, please encourage them to apply. Thank you all. And now, please welcome Hindu Ibrahim, co-chair, International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change, Yanti Saripto, President and CEO, Save the Children USA, and moderator Imran Ahmed, Founder CEO, Center for Countering Digital Hate. Well, thank you so much. It's very nice to be here in a really exciting and interesting room full of people. Um, one of our colleagues may join us, Hindu. She's stuck in traffic right now, which I understand is an occupational hazard in New York. Um, I'm sure London can be like that too. Um, I'm really delighted, though, to be with Yanti. Um, and we're going to sort of make this a sort of fireside chat. I've got some questions which were... Which we're meant to be for the whole for the whole panel, but actually we're just going to freewheel it a little bit. So, you know, the the point of today, and, and I run a very small organisation, twenty staff, um, four years old. We turned four last week, and Yanti runs a very big and an incredibly successful organisation, Save the Children. But we're both here, and we're all here to think about what it might mean to scale up impactful innovation. And it's something that no matter how big you are, you have to think about every single day. Otherwise, you're not doing your job as the leader of an organization like ours. Now, you know, we're both very impact focused, but I'd love to start thinking about the structure of how you build organizations that can deliver impact in a sustained way. And when they get to scale, can continue to innovate and deliver impact as well. So I wanted to, wanted to ask you first, you know, how do you seek out good ideas for incorporation into the many programs that SAVE has. What does it look like to nurture those to a larger reach? Um, yeah, and that's, look, th I think that's always the perennial question for any leader of any organization, right? Even if <laughs> SAVE is 104 years old. So we're, um, and, it's, and that's great on the one hand, and, but it's also the classic example of, but then you get a lot of, if you're not careful, you really fall into the trap of, oh, we've done that for a long time and we've been very successful. So why would we change it, right? So for us, I mean, that concept of having an, a bit of an engine one, engine two view to say, okay, we've, we, yes, our traditional business, survival for newborns, education for, for all children, making sure children are protected, and all of these interventions that some of them we piloted God, in the 60s and the 70s, right? Um, and we were known for it. We're known for um, positive deviance in nutrition. We're known for saving newborn lives. We're known for household economic analysis to understand how much money families actually have to make sure their children are safe and survive, etc. But that doesn't mean you, you always, always have to innovate. Partially, the situation changes. So a lot of our innovation actually comes from directly from our programs at a country level, because that's where the immediate change is visible, 
our staff, our colleagues there, and we have 25,000 staff across the world in 110 countries. Most of those staff are national staff, quite often from the local communities, right? Even in the US, we work in 300 rural communities. Most of our staff is from those communities. It's also a matter of trust building and legitimacy. So a lot of that innovation comes from countries. And I think the benefit of then being, yes, 100 years old and having a lot of scale or size, not necessarily scale, is that you can pick up those ideas and go like, well, that is great if it works in Uganda. So practical example, Uganda, one of the countries that was incredibly hit by uh, lockdowns, the country that had schools closed for almost the longest in the world, 24 months. Uh, our colleagues there really worked, piloted an approach to think about oh, how do we help kids catch up after so long out of school? How do we meet them where they are, irrespective of their age, understand where their literacy, numeracy, social skills are, and then help them overcome it, working with the, the parents, the community, et cetera, in a shorter space of time. We've done some of those interventions in other countries during conflict. Uganda was the first one where we actually piloted it for this lockdown or after lockdown situation. Now we're doing uh, catch-up clubs, which is what it was called, in nine countries um, because we were able to say, oh, this is great. What kind of evidence do we need? Do we need an RCT? And now can we get some seed funding together? Let's go to all of our funders to see if we can actually find and fundraise $25 million to now do it in other countries. So that's an example as to, you know, a lot of your innovation comes from the ground, but then you have to, you have to pick well <laughs> and accept that some, some of the things you pick will not work and will not scale and will ultimately not even sometimes give you the evidence that you were hoping for. Right? But if that is the evidence that you're getting, then you have to be also honest and say, okay, the pipeline is this, and it's a funnel, not a tunnel. Not everything will make it through. That, that is really, I mean, it's a really interesting, uh, this, this is, to a degree I'm quite envious of the notion of being able to tolerate failure in projects and in, this, you know, in and allowing that. How do you prevent you know what? What is what you sometimes see with larger organisations? I think you just, you described it once as pilotitis. So you know, constantly trying new projects to give to say, look, we're doing something new and innovative. Right. And you've survived for 104 years. You've succeeded for 104 years. And in the end, we have to survive as organisations. We have to keep running. We have to keep being economically viable. It's the bit of it's the bit of impact that people forget about is being able to run a good organisation. So how do you how do you strike that balance between resting on your laurels as a 104-year-old organization that clearly has a model that's successful and effective, and at the same time not, you know, not succumbing to sort of pilotitis where you're just chucking mo money after one flashy-sounding innovative project after another. Yeah, and it is hard, right? We ultimately, you know, a couple of years ago, SAVE had multiple innovation labs, because that was all the reason, right? Innovation labs in every country. We had at least five labs or hubs or whatever, pick a name, and we had it. And it was really, it irritated me greatly because you get all these pilots and they're like, well, I don't care about your pilot, but is it scalable? Yeah. Right? And how are we going to get to scale? Not if we have 25 pilots in the air. Even if you're large, like SAVE, that's not, you know, you can't focus, there's never enough money, and it's also a bandwidth issue because sometimes the struggle to get to scale something, and you know something about that, right? How hard it is to have this sm small flower and you want to make it grow, but then you have to overcome issues and for that you need your best talent. If you have 50 other things going, you go like, oh, okay, that one's really hard at the moment, I'm gonna look over here and that is still nice and sexy and everything is, is, is great. So it allows you, it's an excuse to look elsewhere and not do the hard yards because of course it, it is ultimately only 1% inspiration and fun and 99% is just bloody hard work, yeah. right? So we've now merged all these innovation labs and we're like, no, 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 not, not 10 labs, one, global one. Yes, a pipeline. No, it cannot become a bureaucracy, but also an overseeing council, for want of a better word, that says, okay, here's the pipeline. Some of these things are going to have to drop out, right? So not everybody likes that because everybody loves their own idea. And there's also a sense where you have to be really careful, particularly in a large organization. You always think that you are the brightest, most creative, you know, all the wisdom resides within Save the Children really dangerous, right? There's tons of other organizations that have figured these things out before us, and we have to be, and then we have to be excited about that thing that IRC innovated on, or 
or, or that local organization. And we should, uh, you know, uh, uh, instead of saying, no, we've got our safe thing, no, no, it's even better if you then say, I'm gonna take this thing from them and now I'm going to make it big, right? And that is the ultimate, I think, that you, so you have to reward that kind of behavior, uh, but also be a, a little ruthless sometimes on your, on your, on your funnel. That is, you know, it's, it's just a wonderful answer because it, it, the, the funny thing is that to me, who's running a small organization, which has grown very rapidly, but is still small compared to you guys, um, I just think, gosh, that's the kind of, that's the relaxed um, attitude from someone who kind of knows that they, that they can, that has scale already yes. and is able to accommodate innovation. But there's, there's times when scale really matters. You know, there's days that I, I wake up and I think, I wish I was better. I wish I was better at what I did at being the, the CEO of my organization because we need scale. The negative externalities of social media, for example, it's a big issue. It's a global issue. I wish we had 100 times the resource. But there is a place right now where the scale really matters. You've just been to Ukraine. Uh -huh. Can you tell me a little bit about how the scale of Save the Children has been vital to delivering services and what sort of things you're doing out there that scale permits you to do. Yeah, and there I think, yeah, I really think there our scale mattered a lot. So Ukraine, we had presence in the country since 2014, which it wasn't even that long for SAVE's you know, standards, but we were there 2014, but it was small. It was a small team, 25 people, a couple of local partners working mostly in the East, where at the time, of course, most of the response was happening. 24th of February comes along um, and after making sure that staff and colleagues and partners were you know, safe and well and hibernating to some extent. But then you can go immediately into response. So not only do you then have your team on the ground, we could surge in people who had dealt with conflict situations before, who had dealt with large responses before, who had the safety and security uh, training and expertise and experience to, you know, to not you know, run in willy-nilly into an active war zone. Um, we had child safeguarding experts on staff to make sure that you're also not setting yourself up for a complete disaster. Um, and we have a global humanitarian fund that we all fundraise for together. One fund, not 20, one fund, $100 million that you can then immediately say, okay, go, 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 don't worry about the, fundra the fundraising. Will, and, and when you have Ukraine, you know the fundraising is gonna come. That, that didn't worry me in the least. My biggest concern was, safety and security, and can we actually spend the money wisely in a short space of time, because that is what everybody then always wants in that first couple of months. So we had money, you, had, you have working capital that allows you to then start, and then you fundraise on the back of those examples, because then you go like, well, we're there, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're starting cash transfer programming, and you have your things set up and running. And you can use your experience and your you know, your age in this sense, because we have 18, we call them common approaches. They're essentially global products. We say we've done them for a long time. There is evidence. They're in the areas of education, protection, and health. So depending on what you need, you it's essentially a little bit like I'm going to the store, I'm picking this thing up from the shelf, and I'm going to see how it applies in Ukraine. Of course, you have to adapt it. It's not going to look the same in Ukraine as it looks in Ethiopia but the elements and the standards are the same. So your guys in country don't have to worry about, oh, what does a child-friendly space look like exactly? And what, does ha what do we need to have in place? And how am I gonna measure indicators? We have all of that. Off you go. Um, your main you know, concern has to be, can we work with the government? Is it safe? Can we adapt to the situation? Oh, Ukraine. Everybody has a bank account, there's great infrastructure, cash transfer program is actually relatively easy compared to a lot of other countries. So let's start immediately with that. So it allows you to do a lot of things much faster and much more efficiently than, in, than reinventing the wheel every single time. It's incredible. Um, well, thank you, you know, on behalf of all of us, I think, thank you for the work that you folks are doing out there because it really, really matters and it's having a huge difference to something which is probably one of the, the the, the most appalling situations in the world right now. Um, this is, a, you know, this session is, a, is about sort of the, the, the nexus of innovation, of, of big ideas, of technology as well. And, you know, I'm a funny person to be sort of speak, to be 
doing this session because in one respect, most of my work is thinking about the negative externalities of technology, uh, of social media in particular. But we know that these technologies are, bring, are changing the way that, that everything works, including your work as well. What are the, some of the positives and some of the negatives that you've seen coming out of tech in, in your work? Yeah, well, absolutely. And again, if you're 104 years old, sometimes that's also really hard then to grapple with, sure. right? So let me give you two examples. And I actually saw one of them you know, in practice, in, in reality, in Ukraine. Um, Safety Children has also set up a, um, a small global ventures team that really looks at can we um, create, well, organize or mobilize capital to invest in small organizations that are much more, sometimes much more nimble than we are, very innovative. It's, it's, it's that idea of picking up ideas from somebody else. So we've invested in a small company, it's called Library for All. It's essentially, it's, it's tablets, it's offline, it puts books and uh, reading materials on, on a tablet. We've used them in Papua New Guinea, in Ethiopia, etc. And I walked into the, <laughs> the digital learning space in uh, Mikalive, and there were kids with the LF Library for All tablets, right? So it allows you to pick up this, you know, this product that came from a small, probably struggling startup in Australia years ago. We invested a little bit of money in it, we, you know, along with others, and now we're trying to use that and do it in all of our programs everywhere. And it is as relevant in Ethiopia as it is in Ukraine at this point in time, right? Another example is, again, a small, well, yeah, yeah, small entrepreneurial uh, organization actually based here in the United States, ThinkMD. They are doing, um, they're digitizing essentially what a community health worker needs to diagnose kids. Particularly under five-year-olds, they, they die unnecessarily because the diagnosis is poor. Pneumonia is missed, malaria is missed. Uh, diarrhea is missed, right? Things that you don't need to be a completely certified doctor for to be able to do. So can you give them a tool in their pocket that uh, helps them do better diagnosis? Now, we use them in a number of countries, but you still then have to make sure you lift it up and go, can we do it in all of our health programs? And then you do have to sometimes work against the traditional approach of, well, that's going to be really hard, USAID might not like it, or every country will have their own idea, and the Ministry of Health in a particular country might not. So you really have to work sometimes against the grain of that you know, programmatic, projectized approach of we're doing this thing here and we do it in one country. How do you avoid the mistake? So there's a mistake that I see too often with larger organizations. If I remember being told by a CTO of a company I worked for when I was young, in, actually in New York, uh, in my 20s, you never get fired for hiring IBM. And so, yeah, you know, at exactly. the time, the choice was so right. IBM CRM systems or Salesforce.com. Sales, I mean, I'm old enough that Salesforce.com was completely new when I was in my 20s. And so, um, you know, the, the question was then, he, he went with IBM and he said, you, you won't get fired for, for hiring them. And, and you're right, that throughout the, throughout the entire chain that enables us to deliver impact, especially at the fund level, like there's various levels of sclerosis <laughs> and, yeah. and, 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 and a failure to adapt to reality or a lack of trust in innovation or in small scale. How do you make sure that you, you're, the, the people that you're selecting, the programs, the organizations you seek to give your money to, that you seek to enable, that you seek to raise up, aren't just the IBMs? Yeah, and it is, that is tricky, you're totally right. And I think you also have to then sometimes celebrate the, the, the failures, as you say, right? In that pipeline of ours that I talked about, I mean, I'm mentioning some that I think are actually on the cusp of succeeding, but you know, it's not complete scales and let's not completely you know, celebrate before we can um, really see it. But we've also had a few, there, there were actually, there were great interventions, right? A, a tool to help uh, teacher and tenants in schools. It actually, it, it, it wasn't that it didn't work, it just was, too expensive to scale, right? They always talk about what are the levers of scale that you need to overcome. And if it's too linked to, you know, having, uh, having sometimes fantastic connectivity, doesn't always happen in the places where we work. If it's too linked to having fantastic teachers or school principals, sometimes that doesn't scale, right? Because that's not the case in a lot of places where we work. So you have to be very, Brutal. And it was hard because people who worked on that project felt like we've got a great thing here. It's working in, yes, in one country. It's too costly, too risky, we think. And there's other things that have a higher likelihood of success. 
So the opportunity cost you have to constantly, I think, take into account there. Um, I'm only smiling because this is my first time ever chairing a panel. I don't get asked to do these things very often, and I've just realized that we've gone over time, and it's been, right. <laughs> it's been blinking on zero for ages. <laughs> so you've got the rare privilege of my first and only time chairing <laughs> anything ever. Um, I think it's important that you don't fire people when they fail once. <laughs> just saying. Now look, we, you and I run very different organisations, very very different scale. But and I, and I see, I see myself, I see myself in a lot of those people who are sitting here thinking I've got an idea, I want to scale it. Four years ago, I was I was sitting backstage in a green room for the launch of our first ever report. It was the 14th of September 2019. I'd just turned 41. I was, I can't swear here, can I? I was very scared. <laughs> um, and uh, and we're now 20 people. We are we're big we're big enough now that you know we've Elon Musk is suing us. So clearly we've done something right. <laughs> it is a badge of honor, man. Badge it of really honor. Really is. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've, we've been threatened by Robert F Kennedy Jr., Elon Musk, and Heartbeat That's International good. in the last two years. Quite proud That's of that. That's a good list. Yeah. That's a good list. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's. It, it is a rare privilege for me to speak to someone like you. So thank you so much. And thank Likewise. you because, you know, what you do is what we all aspire to do, is to run something which has had heritage scale and brought a lot of good to the world for a long, long time. So thank you. Thank you. We need to get out of here. Please welcome His Excellency Majid Al Swaidi, Director General, COP28, and Moderator Hala Hana, Executive Director, Saul. Your Excellency, thank you for being here. Though I have your permission to call you Majid, so I'll do that. <laughs> Uh, but this is a big week for you, um, and I know that within COP28 you focus particularly on the financing part. Um, so, by the way, we have 10 minutes, and I would love 10 hours, so we're going to just jump right in. Um, but tell us, um, you know, if there are any sets of solutions out there that need a huge infusion in capital, that would be climate solutions, and we have some of them here today. would love to hear you put in context the billions and the trillions that we're hearing about. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here um, in this conversation and to be part of the, the, the discussions that are going on. The UNGA is such an important uh, milestone when it gets, when it's to, when we're on the way to COP. And COP28, we hope, is going to be that real game-changing COP. We've been on a listening tour over the course of this year, and we continue every day hearing from people. And we've we've gone around, we've engaged with with civil society, with NGOs, with youth groups, with uh, indigenous peoples, with everybody we could possibly meet to come up with our vision for, for COP. And that's really formed around four ideas. One being how do we fast track the energy transition? Because energy at, is at the heart of the emissions gap that we have. 43% uh, of emissions are still, um, we need to mitigate. So. How do we make that happen? The second thing, and we need to decarbonize the energy system we have today while we build up that new energy system uh, that we want to get to. So we need to start to talk about what we're giving people instead of all the time talking about what we're taking away. And so that is th two thirds of emissions. The second focus for us, which we heard consistently as we went around the world, was the finance piece that you mentioned. How are we going to raise the trillions of dollars that we're going to need in annual investment to invest in things like energy, but 
some of the other issues as well that I'll talk about later. Um, and how do we do that at speed? Because we have seven years to 2030. And then the third piece is for us about people. How do we make COP? and COP28 about people. That's the adaptation story, food, health, water. Um, how do we make a, a COP that delivers a difference for the average man, woman, young person, indigenous person on the ground, and does it again at speed, not in 10, 20 years? And the last piece is, is that inclusivity, bringing everybody together. And so to answer your question, we need to invest across the board in each of these different types of solutions, and we need to break down some of the many barriers that are preventing finance from getting to them really quickly, because we know that today um, a large proportion of climate investments happening in the developed world, while the majority of emissions growth is happening in the developing world. Mm -hmm. We need to flip that, that equation so that we're seeing capital mobilized in the developing and emerging markets as quickly as possible. Mm. Thank you for that. I, um, it was interesting to hear you talk about bringing in, uh, you know, the current emitters uh, as you are building what's next. Uh, and you've, I think this COP28 is particularly um, kind of focused on including private sector. Uh, can you tell us about that, how you've gone about it? I mean, particularly for a country like the UAE, which is, uh, you know, an oil producer, of course. I'd love to hear your take on it. Yeah, when we approached this, uh, the COP, as a COP presidency, we really came at it in a very humble way, um, saying, you know, what could we do to make a difference? When we started, our instructions from our leadership was they didn't just want to have another COP in a series of COPs that add, added incrementally to the story. There's been fantastic work, but we felt that the importance of this COP comes from the fact that we're host of the global stock take. This is the first assessments from the Paris Agreement um, of where we are. The main goal of Paris is that keeping global temperatures under 1.5 degrees. And we know that we're way off track, and the recent report confirmed that. We've been saying that all year. So what that means is, is that we need to have game-changing solutions. We need to have big steps forwards. And, and so we, we need to approach this differently. What are we going to do? to make sure that we're mobilizing solutions in a different way. And Glasgow was the first COP that really engaged the private sector. I'd say for myself in Sharm el Sheikh, I also noted the big difference in COPs. The last COP that I was involved in, I was the lead climate change negotiator in Paris. I went away for a few years and did some other things and came back. And what I noticed was that we were having the same conversations over and over but in many ways, what we're trying to achieve has changed. In Paris, we were trying to achieve a political outcome. Now, we're trying to achieve results on the ground, right? We're trying to receive, achieve action, implementation. And that means that we need to do what we've talked about for years, leverage government, policy, finance, um, incentives, use that to leverage the private sector and bring private sector in at scale. Because to solve these big problems, we need scale. We need everybody coming in. And so how do we think about doing that? And we can't do that by having an exclusive conversation of some negotiators and perhaps some, some uh, activists. We need to have an inclusive conversation that brings everybody to the table. It brings those activists who drive and give us passion, but it also brings CEOs and, and industry and, and academics and uh, you know, scientists to help us come together and have a conversation. And yes, we need to have indigenous people, young people. Everybody has a contribution, and we want to create the platform and the space where we can bring people together and we can um, hopefully find those big ideas. You know that that's what the UAE is about. That's what Dubai is about. Many of you have been to Abu Dhabi and Dubai and seen how we do a great job of bringing the public and private sectors together to deliver big outcomes. And I think that that's what we're trying to do at COP28. Wonderful. Thank you for that uh, perspective. And it's really inspiring to hear your talk, um, you know, uh, about the, the consultation process, especially with youth and indigenous uh, communities. I would love, how have these consultations changed what you're planning to do for COP28? You know, it's been a real educational tour for us. I think we always knew that the importance of youth, for instance, you know, we've, we very early on decided to nominate a youth 
champion to give a formal voice for young people in the process. That's been part of our development story in the UAE. We had uh, our Minister of Youth, who is our youth champion, Her Excellency Sheikh Mohammed Mazri, was the youngest minister when she was appointed at 22 years old. And she did a great job of bringing the voice of young people into government policy making. And we felt that that was sort of a natural part of our development story. And so that's why we wanted to bring that to the COP. But the more that we went down that, that road, and the more we engaged with civil society, NGOs, indigenous people, the more we felt really confident that this was a good decision to have that very inclusive process. We, we had great conversations with indigenous people in Brazil, in, uh, in, in Africa, in, in different places that I think really add so much value and so much depth to, to the work around nature-based solutions, around, um, I think I saw a stat that said that they're, they, they defend or, or protect 80% of the world's uh, biodiversity. This is a, a community that needs to be engaged in, and I think that I learned a lot certainly about how uh, they have for a long time been excluded from those conversations. And so what can, we, co what can we do to change that? We need to think about how we have these conversations. How do we bring this knowledge into the process? There's a component of COPS that is a negotiated intergovernmental process. We have to protect and preserve that and empower it. But there's plenty of room for us to have conversations with civil society, with NGOs, with all sorts of other groups and bring them into the conversation that make that delivers real action and, and outcomes on the ground. Um, that's very, very encouraging. Thank you for that. What is the hardest part of your job? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I love my job at the moment. I feel that I get to work with young people. I get to, <laughs> I think that, I, I, perhaps not the hardest part. I'll, I'll tell you uh, an experience that I had recently that was illuminating and was um, uh, that I felt very fortunate to have, but was also difficult. Um, recently, we went to Kenya and um, we went for the Africa Climate Summit where we, we, were, we had a, a great announcement of $4.5 billion investment in, energy, in African clean energy. And in that trip, um, I was able to go with UNHCR to visit uh, the Dadaab refugee camp. And this was part of our inclusion and uh, tour, a listening tour. We wanted to go and give a voice to those people who are impacted by climate change uh, in, a, you know, in a vulnerable situation. And I had a series of conversations, one with uh, a, a, a lady who had come to the camp, I was told she was a newcomer. When I asked her how long she'd been there, she'd been there a year. She had nine children. She was heavily pregnant. She had uh, a makeshift shelter that, that I had the privilege to, to be invited into. I, when I asked her why she had you know, come there, which was essentially in the middle of the desert, um, she said that she had been impacted by drought. She, was a, she had had a farm, she had cattle, but drought had destroyed her crops. She'd had to sell, many of her cattle had died, she'd had to sell them off. And she'd come to this camp to provide water and food and, and, and some kind of education to her children, for her children, um, and to at least have some kind of a future. And I think that sometimes when we're thinking about all of these big macro ec economic issues, these big political issues, we forget about that woman who's been a year in a makeshift shelter in an arid uh, place in a camp. And we think of a camp, this was the other thing that struck me. We think of a few thousand, this was a camp of 300,000 people. This was a city. Mm. Um, and, as a, and, the, and then another part of the conversation we were talking to a women's group a small number of, of the women were, were younger uh, teenage uh, uh, girls who, who wanted to ask for uh, a question, and I was really happy to hear it. And they mentioned that they had one latrine for every 100 people. And, that, and, and so the things that, that I learned from this was that there are people in real vulnerable situations. There are people who contributed absolutely nothing to the problem and are impacted the most. And we need to think about how we are making a difference for those people first. What are we doing to make the changes we need to do 
to t keep global temperatures under 1.5, and that has been our North Star. We, we try to avoid getting hung up on the, the sort of mi minutia of various political positions and focus on that 1.5 degrees, because if we don't address that, we're going to have more examples of, of this uh, lady and her situation, and we, we can't do that. So we need to start to make serious decisions about and have honest conversations, coming back to where we started on energy. We know we have an energy system today that we use that we can't switch off. How do we have a conversation about that and about how we transition, decarbonize the one we have, and move to the one we we want to get to so that we can start to address it in a meaningful and, and sustainable way. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, this is all the time we have, but um, I really wish you a great COP28. The world needs it. And thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much. <laughs>
and ask ourselves the question, are they advancing something meaningfully um, that we think is important and should exist in the world? Mm -hmm. um, and if the answer is yes, you know, can we make an argument for why that should exist and why we should support them? Mm -hmm. um, and then look at all the you know, normal business uh, metrics and you know, uh, would companies be successful and do they have a path to market and so on um, and try to support them. So we're very much thinking first about impact um, and then about what's the investment that we'll make and what the shape of it will look like. So let me go a little bit further on that um, because that's, a, that's an early screen, right? Who's going to help you achieve yep. the mission and principles that Mozilla stands for? And then you're applying um, another set of screens about whether you think they have what it takes. So say a little bit about um, not those basic screens, but what's the special sauce? Are there things, are there particular things that you're looking for in the, um, in the enterprises that you're supporting? Yeah, you know, we're looking for um, really people with grit and determination, but more importantly, a passion for solving the problem that they see in front of them. Um, I think they really, you know, entrepreneurship's a long journey. It's a hard journey, whether it's on the for-profit side or non-profit side. Um, You're speaking to the converted. I, 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 everybody sitting here knows this journey. Um, so I think, you know, uh, you know, it's easy to say people should have grit, like everybody says this. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the time when you're really looking at, you know, uh, struggling and making payroll and all those things that you do early on um, and later on as well, you know, you, you need to have that fundamental belief that what you're working on is meaningful um, and that it's going to make the world better. Um, and change the world for the positive. Um, I think that's the only reason people get involved in these types of ventures. You know, otherwise, you know, you can go out, become an investment banker or whatever mm -hmm. that other path might be. Um, but I think if you're really trying to solve problems in the world and make it a better place, that passion needs to come out. I'm seeing some nodding heads here in the room. <laughs> um, Henrietta, the same question for you. So you are starting a, a, a venture fund um, to support social enterprise, and that's exciting um, with other women leaders who've had the kind of experience you've had. And your experience is really interesting. Um, the, the head of USAID, the head of UNICEF. So you're coming at this from a slightly different angle, which is not pure social investment, but also uh, the role of large government uh, organizations, intergovernmental organizations, in supporting um, social enterprise. So what are you looking for um, when you're thinking about the kinds of organizations that you think will get there? Um, so it's great to be here, first of all. Uh, I, I believe that the world needs to scale more. So to Mohammed's good points, uh, what we need are many of these products and services that can really change the world. And so part of our responsibility for those who are a little bit older is to make sure that we can scale all these good ideas and companies. And it means you're going to need public and private funds. We're going to have to get some funding systems that are transparent and that cross public and private lines. Um, you all know the problems that we're having in the developing world for national debts. Uh, it is serious. It means that there will be many ministries that won't have money to spend on new health products. Uh, they just can't afford it. So couldn't public and private money pair? It could. And so I think one of our responsibilities is to try to connect those worlds for the entrepreneur. And so every one of us in this room has a way of helping in that. But that would be my number one. Number two is choose some big platforms that can scale. And think about some of the infrastructure products that can change the world. Uh, when I was at UNICEF, we were trying to make sure that lower satellites could connect every school in the world to the internet. And if it could, then it means that the village hospital and it means that the businesses around the school could be connected to the internet and that families would go there in the evening and they would realize both the importance of school, but also they could check the farming prices or anything else that they needed. So think of some of the things that could just change our world and try to back those so that in public and private money, you can get the platforms that all the young and smaller entrepreneurs need. But I think that's our responsibility. I thank you for that. And I want to I want to go right to that theme of public and private um, because it's let me let me make an assertion and see if you agree or disagree. The assertion would be that there are two basic pathways to scale for enterprises like this. Real scale, we're talking about um, systemic change, uh, large scale change. So one pathway is markets. Um, and many in this room are starting as market based organizations trying to grow and 
earn an income and make a profit, make themselves sustainable. Um, and you grow and scale through markets if you're um, serving a need uh, and you have good luck and determination and you start to sort of organically grow. The other pathway I would assert is um, the endorsement and support of governments. And I don't know whether you think both those pathways are both legitimate pathways for scaling. Um, and I, I have a suspicion that when we talk about social enterprises, there's a tendency to run away from government. Government's part of the problem. So I just want to talk a, a little bit through that question of pathways to scale. Let me start with first with you, Mohammed. Yeah, well, you know, I think it, um, a large part of it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Yes. Um, and I think, you know, in my, my previous life, uh, I was with uh, an organization that in the funded independent media. And we often were, uh, didn't want the government involved anywhere with these companies because you had a tendency in most many countries and, and unfortunately increasingly more countries where um, oligarchs and illiberal countries will try to strangle the independent media and one of the ways you do it is by government taking control through a pension fund to buy the assets of you know the last remaining newspaper or whatever that might be. Um, so in, in certain problem sets you don't want government involved and government money involved because it corrupts uh, the solution you're trying to work for. So I think it, you know, it very much, so sorry, it's a hedge answer, but it depends, right? Um, so sometimes, yes, you know, th there's utility in working with government. Um, I think it depends on the problem you're trying to solve. Right. Henrietta, again. So I'm going to take um, an example out of India. I saw the Clean India, the Swatch Bharat um, program that some of you know. I see a few nodding heads. Uh, and it really spurred entrepreneurism in the water and sanitation. So its purpose was to make sure that there would be um, bathrooms in villages so you could have it at the local school. But it created this burst of uh, entrepreneurial activity. There were so many women who opened up shops about various types of toilets and bathrooms, uh, faucets and basins, but it, it was entrepreneurial. But it was a government program to clean India, to make sure that there would be um, a cleaner, more healthy environment, both rurally and in urban. But companies uh, can pair with countries in programs like that if you just think big enough and you put some funding behind it mm -hmm. so that entrepreneurs can start experimenting and, and um, creating products and services. Mm -hmm. And it creates momentum in the country. Right, so I'm hearing, I think both pathways are legitimate ones, um, for sure. Let's talk about public-private. Um, I guess the one you're describing in India was something of an example in that regard. It was public money spurring private enterprise. I'm just curious, um, for those of you in the room who are solvers, innovators, whether a public money seems like a, 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 a good solution or a realistic solution for you, or are you mostly looking? Let's start with public. You, public, round of applause. Right. Okay. <laughs> a little bit. Private, markets, that kind. <laughs> so a little bit more energy there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Um, so again, just coming back to the two of you and your experiences um, as investors in different guises, um, maybe a success story, something that um, you put money into that really took off and what you thought really made it happen. And then I'll ask of examples of cases where you really thought it would get there and it didn't. And why do you think that was the case? So Henrietta, let me go to you this time and see if there's something that's triggered there for you. Well, a failure is triggered. <laughs> <laughs> we learn most from them. Go um, ahead. So um, I was just out of my uh, college and I was a tennis player. And so my tennis partner and I decided that we would start a company and that we would create tennis greeting cards. Now, you may not have seen tennis greeting cards, so we knew we were into a good sector because no one had thought of it yet. Yeah. So I did the artwork. My partner did the words. We made our cards. We started calling on every greeting card uh, purveyor, every little store. We were so excited when we got our, our orders. And then 
we began looking at what we had created in terms of the money that came in. And we realized that we had not counted our own time or our gasoline, and that we were getting excited about all these orders, but we actually weren't profitable. So sadly, we learned that we had to close business. So one of the lessons you learn as a young entrepreneur is when to close a business. And it's a really important lesson, but I think um, we all learn it. But it's one that we try to teach, especially when you're an early entrepreneur. I'll just note for those who don't know that your family history, your work history really started in family businesses and entrepreneurial businesses, which you still run today. And it was that the foundation for your step into roles in government. So I, you speak of what you know. Um, uh, examples on either side of the equation, Mohammed, something that really took off or something that didn't quite go where you wanted it or expected it to go? Yeah, so, so I'll, give you, I'll give you one of each. So I think you know, one of the, um, we've, we've met many companies um, working in Africa who all had the idea that there should be a pan-African media product that should exist. Um, and every single company and every single market thought they were the ones who could go mm -hmm. in African. And every single one of them failed mm -hmm. in the same way after spending a lot of money. Um, and I think it's, it's always easy to sit back and think whether if you're in Johannesburg or in Nairobi um, or wherever you are that you, what you, the problems you're solving in your market can exist and you can take that and export it to the countries around you. Um, it inevitably it doesn't work. People spend a lot of money doing it. Um, and it's not that the individual newsrooms and news organizations fail in doing this. Um, we failed as well in trying to convince the entrepreneurs that the plans were just going to burn through money and they wouldn't see results. And we saw this happen time and time again. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a bit about trying to simplify the understanding of the continent, even though people were from the continent themselves, mm -hmm. um, and not understanding their neighbors. Um, and we really struggled to find good examples where people went in did this well. So that's kind of on the failure side. I think it's really you know, uh, knowing what you know and thinking it applies everywhere without really being able to go and test that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of success, you know, we've, we, we were an early investor in a company called Alapa AI um, out of South Africa. Um, and the company started building AI solutions um, for the African market and for Africa, but with African talent, with the insight that uh, they were going to be able to have the math, P, uh, math, statistics, AI, computer science talent that would be in Africa, returning to Africa, and they'd be able to start building product there. And they had this insight before this wave of AI that we all now see took off. Um, and it was an early insight. And being able to see the team and seeing that they had this vision, they made, they, you know, and they were able to draw people together um, in Africa and being able to attract them um, I think it's going to be one of our key successes, just being able to see the insight they had. Um, and other people just couldn't see what they were seeing. Um, but they were able to convince us and we were able to believe, one, that Africa could produce um, the talent to tackle you know, the biggest problems in the world that were previously only tackled in Silicon Valley mm -hmm. or in London. Um, and two, they would be able to attract the talent to do that. Right. Thank you. Oh, could I add a, uh, something onto this? So, one of the other things that I've seen that builds on Mohammed's thought is we started drone corridors uh, for delivering of blood supplies. And many of the private companies were looking at them for delivery of products. And sometimes you can piggyback onto someone else's technology or company that's in a completely different sector. And you can do something that is for good, for impact. And it will have different economics and financial model, but it's a really interesting way to grow. And so we used many of the telecom companies for birth registration. So when a baby is born that you could take a picture of the baby and you could enter them on the rolls as a person in the country. So, so look for some of those um, um, avenues and they can be very powerful. Yeah, I appreciate that. So we're in our last minute. And I'm glad you both mentioned the things you did um, about AI and uh, and so forth, thrones. Because the last question I have is really one about looking to the future. Um, if we're looking to the future, what is it you're excited about as an investor? What are you? What are you? What are you excited about, Mohammed? Um, no, right now we really we're really excited about the possibilities of AI, um, and where people were able to build things and augment human capability, but in a way that's 
you know, uh, pro-human rather than in a way that's, you know, looking to harvest our data and, you know, uh, become a system of oppression to us or reinforce bias that exists in society. Um, so we're looking for people to take novel approaches to be able to say, how can we build and use this technology to benefit people? Um, and to, you know, almost in a way, you know, we've got this dominance of big tech and platforms and in some countries of government, you know, systems of surveillance. And how do we use this technology to almost help people claim back the internet mm -hmm. um, and claim back the power of technology for themselves? Big challenge. Big challenge, but great people working on uh, solving it. Henrietta. Uh, so I'll go for after-school programs. I think there's just been an explosion of after-school programs where you can learn a skill. You can learn it on your cell phone. And uh, the ability to then break open all the talent in the world is just stunning. Huge need, huge opportunity. And then if I could have a second one, um, it's on mental health. Mental health is the issue of this generation. and. We've got to try to help every country, everywhere in the world. Uh, there's a program that Spotify created where, um, you know, many of the cell phones are the cheapest <laughs> ones have advertisements on them. So instead of having an advertisement that is all about a product or service, it's an advertisement that is about good mental health so they can refer uh, young people who are listening to an NGO for mental health. But this is just, this is a huge need. Uh, we've got to be able to find a way to make it uh, remunerative and financially operable, better than tennis greeting cards. <laughs> um, but, but I think it just has huge potential. So I'll name those two. I love that we went both to high tech and to people oriented um, services. Really great suggestions. We're out of time. I want to thank both of you, and I want to thank all of you for bringing your energy to this conversation. Thank you. We're at a time where the world's facing immense human challenges. And what we need are new solutions. We need people coming together to create new technologies, certainly, but also new behaviors, new ways of common action. And solvers are the people at the frontiers of those challenges. With our supporter organizations, we have facilitated over $65 million to innovators. We cannot do this alone. We really need everyone to come to the problem-solving table. winner of this year's AI for Humanity Prize is Kimberly Seals Hellers, the founder of Earth. I just won $100,000 from the McGovern Foundation. I will work the hell out of this grant. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick J. McGovern Foundation is an institution that's committed to the idea that in a digital future, we can promote human equity, dignity, and justice for everyone. At MIT Solve, we've been proud sponsors of the AI for Humanity Prize. This prize means so much to our team. We're gonna be able to really scale the impact that we know we can have because of the McGovern Prize. It's not just the solution that they're supporting, but also the people and that connectivity to the problem like myself. I come from a refugee and immigrant family. It's been a game changer in terms of helping us grow the community and network. Social entrepreneurship doesn't happen in isolation. It happens with mentors, with coaches, and with other travelers on the same journey. MIT Solve has been the platform to find those individuals, to create new connections and new partnerships, and expand our thinking about how we do social entrepreneurship, not just for personal success, but for a transformation of the world. You know what this means? It's prize time. <laughs>
But I want to say a huge thank you again to the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation for their support over the years and their continued commitment to our work and our mission. And to announce this year's AI for Humanity Prize recipients, please join me in welcoming Elizabeth McGovern, Chair and Trustee, Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, I want to say, on behalf of the Patrick J. McGovern Foundation, over the last five years, I feel so big. <laughs> okay, can I keep her with me, though? <laughs> the last five years has been such an honor, such a joy, such a privilege. We have together supported amazing social entrepreneurs who have been using AI to address climate, health, social justice, uh, education. So really, I want to thank you uh, so much. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. you make it possible. So okay. thank, thank you. you. <laughs> and thanks to all of you um, for your patience. After much debate, discussion, debil deliberation, we are ready to announce the winners of this year's AI for Humanity Prize. For those who do not know, uh, the AI for Humanity Prize is open to any solutions who are leveraging AI or data science for the betterment of humanity. This year, there is a total of $150,000 that will be awarded across four solver teams. So I am ready to make that announcement. <laughs> the first one, Lucrify, Small <laughs> Business Finance Control. Come on up. Come on up. Come on down, as they say. <laughs> Senefa. Oh, this isn't on. Senefa, Smart Even Greenhouses. We're going to come here for a photo. And last but certainly not least, GNYPWD Accessible Connect. Congratulations. There is more to come, and you know it. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming our next prize announcer, the delightful James Newell, GSR Executive Director of Corporate Social Responsibility, who will be awarding the GSR Foundation Prize. <laughs> right, try and match that energy. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So everyone at GSR was ludicrously impressed with the extraordinary display of innovation that we saw, um, and all of you must be incredibly proud to have reached the point you've reached. Just to introduce the GSR Foundation, we're an independent grant-making charity founded by GSR, which is a leading cryptocurrency trading firm, and GSR works on the financial systems of the future, but this is in a world where today some 1.4 billion adults are unbanked, and over double that number have never used the internet. We believe that Web3 innovation has the power to drive positive change, change that will be accelerated and enhanced by removing the myriad barriers that stop people from participating in or benefiting from new technologies. But this is a huge goal, and the barriers creating exclusion are varied and complex, from societal norms to unreliable infrastructure and everything in between. As evidenced by the talent in this room and all the people I've had the pleasure to talk to over lunch and everything, um, the solutions have to come from the populations that experience the problems. Too often interventions from the global north miss the point, are ineffective, or even damaging. Our philanthropy is about creating space for excellent nonprofits and the people who lead them to ideate, think, and innovate. To this end, the GSR Foundation awards $200,000 across four solutions to address the financial inclusion challenge. We're delighted to grant 50,000 to each of the following solvers, Naya Health, Pacer Kit, <laughs> and come on up. <laughs> Ray.
Rahul Bima. And Tiny Totos. Not this one. Um, and to announce the winners of this year's HP Prize for Accelerating Digital Equity, I'm so pleased to welcome to the Solve stage a longtime supporter of Solve, Mariama Kavya, Digital Equity Accelerator Lead, Social Impact at HP. <laughs> Good afternoon. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to all of the solvers for their innovative and inspiring solutions. Today, I am honored to announce the HP Prize for Accelerating Digital Equity. This prize, funded by HP, recognizes solutions that advance digital equity in education, healthcare, and economic opportunity in communities across the US and across the globe, specifically for marginalized groups and communities. Uh, the original prize was set to award $100,000 to up to four solver teams from across the 2023 Global Challenges, as well as past solver teams. We were so inspired by the organizations and the applications that we decided to increase the prize. Yeah. HP, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> HP increased the award to $150,000 so that we could support six solver teams. After very much consideration, we are thrilled to announce that the following solver teams have been awarded the HP Prize for Accelerating Digital Equity. Cushy Baby. G-N-Y-P-W-D. <laughs> and we have four alumni awardees as well. These include Utiva, <laughs> uh, Levox, <laughs> Beeline Reader, And Weird Enough Productions. So Solvers, again, congratulations. And we're so excited to support your digital equity work. As you can see, once a solver, always a solver. So that's a good news. Um, General Motors couldn't make it today, so I have the luck to announce their prize. The GM prize is open to solutions that help create smart, safe, and sustainable communities around the world. The prize is funded by General Motors, uh, which is working towards becoming the most inclusive company in the world and is dedicated to making STEM education more accessible and equitable. Up to $150,000 will be awarded across up to six recipients for the Learning Climate Challenges and the Indigenous Communities Fellowship. So please join me in congratulating the, reception, the, rest, the recipients of this year's GM Prize, uh, Natives Rising. <laughs> yeah. Makaana Kaulai, Hawaii. La Fur, La Fio, <laughs> B 
Build Up Nepal Echo 2 Brick. <laughs> GNY PYD accessible than that. <laughs> and mapping justice. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Let's take a picture. <laughs> oh, there you go. Awesome. Nice. <laughs> Yay! Well done. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask you to go the other way. Here, go exit the stage. Thank you so, so much. Congratulations again. Wonderful work. <laughs> And now, please welcome to the stage, impact artist, Marco Santini. Thank you. Have you ever felt the surge of frustration right when you're on the brink of something extraordinary? Today was a real adventure, many different perspectives and insights. But how can we solidify today as a true pivotal moment in our journeys? As we've seen today, we are a variety of different backgrounds, perspectives, shapes, colors, and sizes. We, it really speaks to my belief in unity and diversity, celebrating the fact that we are all the same and all different, which is beautiful. My name is Marco Santini. I am an interactive impact artist. I travel around the world and I mirror the spirit of communities through creative, collaborative designs. Today I had the honor of being an active listener. To me, an active listener is someone who is present in the moment, listening to every word without letting the mind wander. I listen to your visions, I listen to your ideas, and I listen to your dreams. And through all that, I was taking in all those words and then I decided to paint them around the very emblem that brought us all together, the Solve logo. When you look closely at this, you will see many different ideas that kept coming up. Collaboration, inspire, mission. To me, I find it incredibly important to capture those words, not only to amplify them, but because I believe it is so important to realize our words matter. What we say matters. And that's because our words are the seeds of change, the building block of actions. According to a study by Dominican University in California, we are 42% more likely to accomplish our goals simply by writing them down. 42%. Can you imagine that? So I want to amplify what we are all saying together here, showing these words back to you so that we can all manifest our visualizations. Beyond active listening, I also actively engage with communities around the world. I've had the privilege of leading these creative designs at different locations. And uh, it's gone from the United Nations General Assembly to uh, museums, Fortune 500 companies, and even schools around the world. And to me, it's really important to empower people to feel seen and heard. When I go into these communities, I ask them you know, simple but profound questions. What's important to you? What inspires you? And then just like I did today, I take those words, I paint them into a mural, into a painting, and they just are amplified. They feel more connected to their space. It's really beautiful to see how it all comes together. They forge deeper connections with their communities, and it's a powerful reminder that we all can make a difference. Because as creators, I believe we are all creative. I got asked this today. To me, creativity means turning our thoughts into actions. And we are all creative in different ways. And if we can agree on that, I believe as creators, we are all superheroes. Our superpower is the ability that we get to see the future before it exists. We get to create for that future. Now, there will be struggles, and progress is not a, a linear process. I know personally, 
It was incredibly difficult for a while. I felt very, very lost trying to find my greater purpose. I was hopping from job to job, and I just wasn't getting that fulfillment that I was looking for. And I felt like I was wasting my most precious resource of time. And it just kept getting to me and getting to me, and I didn't let that get me down because I was very fortunate to have an incredibly supportive family, friends, and wife who's here with me today. They basically taught me that it was okay to fail if I failed forward and I learned from my mistakes. It was okay to feel this way if I was moving forward. And they made me feel like anything was possible. And in that moment, I, I remember it so distinctly, I just felt so empowered, I wanted to have other people feel that way. Because if we all could feel that way, just imagine what we could do. And so from there, I was very fortunate enough to find my life's purpose with the support of everyone I just, just mentioned to basically inspire dreams through education and art. It was my idea here. <laughs> I was always fascinated with communication, different cultures. I ended up taking all that information along with my degree in lingu uh, linguistic anthropology from Brown University. I put it all together and I created my first impact design, my One Love logo. Some of you saw the sticker I was giving out today. This logo has the word love in over 100 different languages. It's meant to symbolize that there's more that unites us than divides us. If you look closely in there, you'll see that Turkish is next to Armenian. You'll see Arabic is next to Hebrew, which is next to German. And forever, I've been putting Russian and Ukrainian next to each other. And it's a vote of confidence for our future that despite our differences, we still have this common word that we all share. We still have a vote of confidence that tomorrow can be better. I've learned that art has the power to transcend language barriers and ignite imaginations. And I'm very grateful to be standing here today in front of you. This entire day has been extraordinary, doing what I love to be doing because I found my passion. And so I urge you, I, I, I hope to remind you that you have something special in you to follow and embrace your magic because you have something to share with the world. Because I've painted around the world and the one true universal idea that keeps coming back to me is the fact that we are all connected. And this painting, to me, is a symbol of our interconnectedness. When you look at this piece on the screen in first and hopefully later, I hope that you are reminded of the infinite possibilities that we have together. I hope that when you see this piece, it reminds you to stay true to your creative heart, whatever that takes you. And that I hope when you see this piece, it reminds you that today was not just an ordinary day, not just every other day. Today was actually a milestone for you because you were getting to where you want to be going and you will look back at today and be so thankful as I am to be here with you today. Together, I know we can create a more inclusive world. And if we can transcend our differences, come together and create this painting, just imagine what else we can solve. Thank you. I guess they're not calling for me, so I'll just come. <laughs> what a day. Thank you so much. I mean, watching the solvers, watching you come on stage, get seen, get funded, get supported, get cheered, you are the reason we gather. So thank you. And there are lots of thanks to give. Uh, I want to thank every person here for believing in change uh, that starts at the margins in scaling the change and in our mission and our work. Thank you for our inspiring speakers, our artists, our moderators, to every innovator who submitted an application, to our ch challenge leaders and judges, um, to our sponsors and prize funders, you are our enablers, and the incredible SOL staff, backstage and front stage heroes. None of this would be possible without you. Thank you. <laughs> And one last time, I want to turn the spotlight back to where it belongs to, to one more time an applause for the 2023 Solver class. <laughs> We're almost at the curtain fall, but this does not end here. Whether you're interested in sponsoring an area of impact, venturing into impact investing, creating your own challenge, your funds will change lives. Find someone for our partnerships team to learn more. 
and Sarah, our director of <laughs> partnerships. That's Sarah. <laughs> uh, uh, we always have exciting challenges open for application on our platform. Uh, and if you're interested in learning more about them, come talk to us. We, uh, and, and we're always thinking, obviously, of what's next. Our 2024 global challenges are on the horizon. Uh, the, the themes are broad because we want to work with you to shape and prioritize and fund them. So talk to our director of global challenges, Alexander. <laughs> Alexander. <laughs> OK, I'm done making people wave. Um, but please mark your calendars. In May, we reconvene on MIT campus for Solve at MIT. It will be the capstone event for the teams that you met today. And keep an eye out also, because we're soon announcing the dates for our Indigenous Innovators Summit, which will be in, um, in Tucson, Arizona, in early March. About a mile of the river, officials are convening to talk 2030 agenda and sustainable development goals. But we are here in this room, united not just by our shared impatience for change, but also a shared vision where technology is a managed fire that unites us. Where innovation isn't just about creating the next app, but about closing equity gaps. And where being an entrepreneur isn't just about building a business, but about changing futures. Today, we met 31 amazing solvers. Let's ask ourselves, what would it take for those 31 solutions to change the world? Because that may very well be our legacy. So enough of my talking. Let's have some fun now. Please join us for the closing reception. We'll be sharing stories and talk future collaborations. We hope to see you there. Um, the exit is this way. And I'm looking forward to celebrating with all of you. Thank you very much. <laughs>